welcome. This is Meet the Candidates on BCTV. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I would like to welcome to the show James Ellers, gubernatorial candidate. Pleased to meet you. Olga, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity. How was your trip down this morning? Thank you for making it all the way to the southern part of the state. It was, it was bright and sunny, and uh, John did an excellent job of keeping us between the lines. So. <laughs> the, yes, sometimes staying within the lines is a good plan. Yeah. So how is the campaign going so far? What, what has been kind of the question you're getting the most from Vermonters when you're out on the campaign trail? Oh, well, to answer your first question, it's, it's been going really well. Um, it's, it's inspiring. It's certainly, it's certainly hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard work, but it, you know, it should be. And, but meeting and connecting with people who uh, the office has the ability to help uh, and, and knowing that they're, they're behind what we're doing, that's, you know, there's, it's, it's a hard feeling to, to describe. The question that gets most frequently asked, um, it, it varies mm -hmm. by area uh, of the state, but overall I think it has to do with uh, affordability. Governor mm -hmm. Scott um, did frame much of the political discussion around the affordability question, and so uh, people ask me, you know, how I'm going to make Vermont more affordable since uh, Governor Scott has, has fallen flat mm -hmm. on, on that promise. And I, I would love to hear how you plan to do that, but before you answer that kind of question, I want to take a step back. You know, it was really interesting listening to Scott talk about affordability mm -hmm. because it, it felt at times like he was looking at affordability through a very narrow lens mainly taxes, um, regulations, those sorts mm -hmm. of things. But affordability is a much bigger pie. So I'm wondering, how do you define affordable? Like, what would an affordable Vermont look like to you? A place where we can all live with, with just our basic needs, our, our dignity mm -hmm. uh, being honored as human beings. So uh, I agree with you. I think he is looking at it through a very narrow lens, which is what uh, most uh, corporate executives and millionaires mm -hmm. uh, do, uh, but for those of us uh, with with our roots um, still in the working class, uh, there's there's nothing uh, Governor Scott did this session to make Vermont more affordable, and I would argue just the opposite: uh, failure to sign uh, minimum wage increase, failure mm -hmm. to support paid family leave, um, his undermining of union contracts, increasing uh, uh, health insurance, co-pays, um, making prescriptions more expensive and certain procedures mm -hmm. more expensive. And then of course there's the longer term affordability issues. Uh, when, when the governor doesn't hold polluters accountable uh, what he's doing is making Vermont more and more expensive and taxing, mm -hmm. if you'll permit the use of the word in that connotation. Uh, he's making Vermont more taxing for those of us that you know, don't live uh, high up on the hill, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, where downstream uh, we feel the impacts of all poor public policy. Mm -hmm. What would you like, if, if there were three things you could do to make Vermont more affordable, what, what would they be? Well, the first thing uh, we're going to do is reignite the universal health care discussion uh, because it's, it's tied directly to uh, many of the other budgets in the state. So um, Brattleboro's budget, for example, uh, municipal budgets, mm -hmm. school budgets, uh, and even the budgets for small business owners, many of whom would like to pay higher wages but can't afford to offer higher wages and uh, help with health insurance benefits. So universal health care, and it, it, it's as well as the morally bright thing to do, uh, it's, 
it's an economic tool for the state to attract and retain mm -hmm. uh, people who, who want to stay in Vermont. So universal health care, because it's, again, such a, a profound part of the economy. And so with that wages, mm -hmm. um, starting with um, you know, publicly traded companies, the, you know, we'll call it the box store okay. chain economy. Uh, if publicly held companies can afford to pay dividends and we have to listen daily to people boast about the historic uh, stock market performance, well then those companies can afford to pay the people that make them profitable, not just a $15 minimum wage, mm -hmm. but we need to start talking about a living wage, which in the Brattleboro region, $22 an hour. It's around what I've seen, yeah. Yeah, so um, $15 an hour, in 2024, um, I appreciate the legislature's uh, intention, but I also think uh, when a legislature realizes they have a partner in the governor's office rather than an adversary, uh, our partners in the legislature will be willing to look at uh, you know, more robust uh, solutions that get at the foundation, at the roots of the problem rather than just uh, trimming the branches, so mm -hmm. to speak. And what would be a third thing for affordability? Uh, um, child care. Uh, so we hear frequently how uh, some employers in certain sectors have a hard time uh, finding people who, who want to work. But we also know that there's uh, many, particularly single um, parents, predominantly women, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, would love to work, but you can't afford childcare uh, to get back in the workforce if you're making $12, $13 an hour. The Joint Fiscal Office uh, indicates that it's on average, if you can even get access to childcare, if there's right. openings, for two children, it's, it's you know, 20 2000 to $24,000, mm -hmm. so uh, $10 an hour, that's $20,000. Well, the minimum wage right now is 10, 1050 but you know, that's, you, why would you go to work just right. to pay for child care? It doesn't make any sense. So again, this is something that I believe these investments in people mm -hmm. uh, will uh, pay dividends uh, down the road mm -hmm. because people are drawn to communities where we invest in uh, our education system, our environment, and, and our people. You've had quite the profession yourself. You've been a middle school teacher. Mm -hmm. You've been the executive director of the Lake Champlain International Organization. Mm -hmm. You've been the publisher of uh, Vermont Outdoors, line cook, farmer, ski coach. Uh, what has been your experience with public office? Well, the, probably the most notable experience is um, my time uh, as, a, as a naval officer. Mm -hmm. So my life began in public service and a lot of those, uh, shall we say, um, undertakings were, you know, to pay the bills, um, literally, mm -hmm. uh, so I could undertake or, or do other things. Um, so my, my involvement with the legislative process has been uh, as a public policy advocate, both in the formal role, uh, being, uh, having the honor and the privilege of running an environmental uh, health organization, uh, but also in my willingness to take up other causes that I wasn't being paid for, but in the area of social services or uh, first responders where mm -hmm. I would um, help advance bills uh, for people because of my uh, legislative experience and the fact that um, they need help and, mm -hmm. and regular people can't afford the lobbyists that corporations uh, can afford. 
So I've served as the economic development uh, chair for the town of Colchester, uh, appointed to that committee, but then elected by my members and um, was there for, uh, it was a while ago, four or five years. Okay. Um, so uh, my role as an advisor to Senator Sanders on Veterans Affairs and the Environment has brought me to Washington, D.C. My, my role on uh, numerous government uh, affairs committees, uh, Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, uh, Conservation Interest. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I had always seen myself in a support role hmm. for like-minded uh, elected officials mm -hmm. as the advocate. But ultimately, uh, there's just, there's just, it, there's too many problems that could be fixed uh, to just stand by and, and, and not take responsibility myself. So uh, getting back to the Navy, uh, my last position was basically that of the, the chief first responder. Okay. Um, we run towards fires. We don't run away from them. And uh, what's going on uh, in combination with Washington, D.C.'s uh, trickle-down economic philosophy paired with our own governor's, uh, albeit uh, much more polite, uh, trickle-down uh, philosophy, it's, it's destroying our state. It's, we cannot continue to perpetuate an economy that exploits people in, in our little portion of the planet. So the Democratic side of the primary ticket mm -hmm. is pretty packed. How do you differentiate yourself from the other candidates? My experience, mm -hmm. uh, my uh, diversity of experience. Um, I'm, I'm a blue collar kid. Uh, first in my family to go to college, uh, and, and a, a good portion of why that even was possible uh, was because my grandmother used my grandfather's uh, death benefit uh, as a, a union firefighter that died in the line of duty mm. to help um, my mom raise me and my two brothers. You know, so, um, and then uh, I got a scholarship uh, out of high school. And so uh, my perspective on, on the world, having grown up in a, in a family where my natural father was an electrician, my mother was a bookkeeper, um, carpenters, plumbers, dock workers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my time as a naval officer where um, I interacted with, you know, people from very, very diverse backgrounds. Uh, ha I think has has shaped me substantially. On the policy side, well, um, I exhibited the vision and the courage a year ago when no one thought Governor Scott could be beat and didn't want to uh, risk taking him on when I felt um, we didn't have a choice mm -hmm. but to challenge him, regardless of how well he was polling. Uh, a year ago, mm -hmm. because I did file a year ago, and I've been campaigning uh, for a year, and I've, I believe I've been to, to Brattleboro seven or eight times already. Mm -hmm. So um, my ability, having worked in logging and in farming, to connect to um, rural Vermonters in a very substantive way uh, is another distinguishing factor. Mm -hmm. uh, my leadership on espousing and, and bringing to light the problems with uh, corporate money in our political system has already changed the Democratic primary. So uh, there's more. Um, I know we don't have... Um, uh, <laughs> oodles and oodles of time. Yeah, but um, I'm, I'm happy to answer in detail on any, any of the policy areas because I think, I think there are substantive differences. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that uh, while the platforms uh, other candidates have brought forward uh, in their individual areas have, have merit, mm -hmm. certainly, uh, they tend to be much more narrow in their focus than the tax reform 
getting at the root of what is um, causing all of these other symptomatic issues. So uh, you mentioned policy. Give me a couple examples of where you differ on policy. Uh, my openness about asking the affluent um, to pay their fair share in taxes. Mm -hmm. That was my first interview with Vermont Public Radio a year ago. I uh, haven't backtracked, won't backtrack uh, on that. Um, and my experience, my firsthand experience in knowing how much corporate money influences politicians. You know, the, the, the interesting part about that is um, these big corporations, mm -hmm. they employ smart people. They're not going to waste money on who they give their money to. So either, either they're giving money to show support for someone who already shares their philosophies, or they're giving support to encourage someone to adopt their philosophies. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two reasons. So um, the fact that Governor Scott is proud to take money from Monsanto and doesn't see a problem with that must mean he already you know, values what Monsanto is doing in the world. Because mm. he said it doesn't influence him. Uh, well, we know Monsanto is influencing public policy, and that's, you know, that's another area of distinction. When you, when you firsthand know the implications of corporate money, um, you don't have to you know, be taught or shown or have someone explain it to you. Mm -hmm. Monsanto is, is poisoning our, our, our food supply, our soil, our waterways. Mm -hmm. And that's just one example. Shifting gears a little bit, one issue that's big in this area, especially right now under Act 46, mm -hmm. is education. What plans do you have around education? So my understanding is that Brattleboro schools, um, people are proud of their schools. and mm -hmm. You have a, a high quality school system. And I think uh, folks uh, watching, listening, should be congratulated for prioritizing in investing in in our children. So uh, thank you to everyone watching uh, for doing so. Uh, we need to do more of that um, and follow the example of Brattleboro's communities. I know Act 46 has been controversial. Mm -hmm. um, we obviously, uh, I think you can um, want to make investments in communities and still be fiscally responsible where local communities realize mergers make sense for them. Mm -hmm. They've, for the most part, have already made those decisions. But as governor, I would never force a community to close its school. And it runs contrary to the spirit of, of Act 46, where mm -hmm. we made a promise to the people of Vermont. And I don't make promises I can't keep. Uh, so forcing a school closure is something uh, I will never do. Uh, because schools are the hub of our community. And if the school has extra infrastructure at this point in time because a student population is low, well then let's, let's use that as a community hub for additional social services, for, for daycare, mm -hmm. childcare. Uh, any of us who are parents of young kids or have been parents of young kids you can spend a lot of time uh, running kids back and forth between a different school setting to a childcare setting. And that's another way to bring people together around their community. Gutting our, our smaller communities while at the same time we're trying to um, build them, uh, that's, if, if it's not intentionally misleading, then it, it's, 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 um, it's foolhardy. You mentioned raising wages as one of the ways to make Vermont more affordable. What are your thoughts around economic development? Do you see it as something about bringing new businesses in? Do you see it as something that there's something in the structure of government we need to tra change? What are your thoughts on kind of boosting economic development? Uh, I like that you mentioned culture uh, because for me leadership is about culture. Leaders are rarely, rarely a subject matter expert, uh, but we bring people together who have a shared vision, a shared 
uh, value system to find the best solutions. So for me, economic development isn't about uh, handouts to corporations. It's about investing in people and our communities. Mm -hmm. I don't think Brattleboro is talking about seceding to New Hampshire. Not that I've heard. <laughs> right. So I want to invest in Brattleboro because mm -hmm. companies, they take uh, government assistance and they move on. Um, acquisitions, mergers, just market changes. But investing in the infrastructure of Brattleboro, that will attract business. Investing in the people of Brattleboro, in their education, in their health care, in their families, will provide the labor force, the healthy, educated uh, labor that employers want. And mm -hmm. protecting the environment is very much about economic development. Hmm. People do not want to move to, businesses do not want to be located in communities uh, where their water is polluted with neurotoxins or, or heavy metals or the horrific situation in, in our sister community, Bennington, uh, where the governor once again sided with industry, mm -hmm. sided with insurance companies over our very own fellow Vermonters. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's about priorities, that our executive branch is here to serve the interest of Vermonters, not the interest of a handful of affluent donors or corporations. Right. And for me, as, as a candidate very much of the people, by the people, it's easy to be for the people. It's, this, mm -hmm. isn't, this isn't a hard decision for me. There's one thing on your, two things on your website that I found intriguing. First, I would love for you to define what a people-first economy is for you. Mm -hmm. But also, I think this goes hand in hand with it, is a Vermont that honors its traditions and natural resources. Mm -hmm. So people first. We often hear that um, we can't afford, the government can't afford to do this or do that. Well, if, you're, if your philosophy is based on protecting the most affluent, well, OK, then I can see how you see things that way. But for me, uh, a people first economy, a people's first agenda, a people's budget, is what do Vermonters need from our government? Where has the market failed to deliver uh, the things that people need just to get by mm -hmm. in some cases? So we're going to consider the data from the Joint Fiscal Office around things such as the basic needs budget uh, for the average um, person living in Brattleboro, like mm -hmm. we said, it's around $22 an hour. And our budget is going to reflect policies that move us towards that. So um, you know, this, uh, this, this uh, hollow rhetoric around uh, a surplus, governor mm -hmm. says we have a surplus. Uh, no, uh, I, I believe we have a deficit mm. in human services. We have a deficit in environmental protection, and all we have to do is look around. Uh, nature doesn't negotiate. Our lakes and streams don't lie. People are suffering. Health care, mental health services, environmental quality. Uh, there's a lot of struggles, but ultimately I'm, I'm optimistic because we broke it. Mm -hmm. We can fix it if we change our priorities. We can't do it, you know, just nibbling around the edges or trimming the branches. We have to get to the root of the problem, and the root of that problem is uh, income inequality, mm -hmm. and that's driven by those handful of, of special interests that are benefiting, even enriching themselves through the status quo. 
James Ellers, wonderful speaking to you. We're just about out of time. Was there anything you wanted to add or wish I had asked? I would like to ask everyone watching to please go and be a part of the process. This is a team sport, uh, and I'm not interested in doing this by myself. I can't do it without people participating in the process. And early voting is open now. Yes, it right? is. Until yep. August 14th. So I encourage everyone uh, to get out between now and August 14th and cast a ballot even if it's not for me. <laughs> and if people want to learn more about you, what's your website? Uh, okay, I got it. Uh, James Ellers, E-H-L-E-R-S, four, F-O-R, Vermont, all spelled out as well. James Ellers, for Vermont.com. We're also on Facebook. And this being a people-powered, grassroots campaign, not accepting corporate money, I would just ask that people find a way to get involved because, as we know, a few dedicated, committed individuals can, in fact, change the world. Thank you for joining us today, James. Thank you. And thank you for what you're doing and for Access Television and uh, for Brian's excellent production work. <laughs> yes, thank you, Brian. <laughs>